Okay, um, this is a great group. Let's go ahead and get started. So I'm very pleased to welcome Till Sturmer. Um, Till is the chair of our Department of Epidemiology in the School of Public Health and the Nancy Dreyer Distinguished Professor there as well. And he has done a lot of work on a lot of different things, cancer and pharmacoepidemiology, and also um, anal analysis of claims data. And um, what he's going to talk about today is propensity score matching, which is a great methodological topic. I know a lot of people here have used propensity scores, would like to. Um, so now's your chance to learn more about it. So thank you very much for joining us today. And um, we go, well, as you know, it's all about uh, a little before one and then the questions, okay. either throughout or at the end, whichever you prefer. Sure. Well, thanks, Elizabeth, for, for the invitation. And, and um, I, I have to admit that um, I, I gave uh, Elizabeth a choice of topics, and she chose that, so there you go. <laughs> it's not entirely me. I take full responsibility for this choice. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this is just one slide on, on, on epidemiology at UNC, and, and uh, uh, I would strongly suggest you, you, you Google the history, and uh, the first 40 years has been published uh, uh, probably two years ago now, and it's, it's a very interesting uh, read, uh, the whole idea that uh, public health and epidemiology is something that would need to move out of uh, the School of Medicine to become their, their own school. Uh, fascinating uh, read, just wanted to highlight some of the, the history uh, of epidemiology. So, um, the, the, this is uh, the start of the topic here, and these are uh, two tables. Uh, they are uh, exposed and unexposed. E equals zero is unexposed, E equals one is exposed. And then we have the people with the outcome, and here is the overall n in the group. And then we have stratified by a dichotomous covariate x equals zero and x equals one. If you're not that abstract, then just think about the exposure of the inhalers that you need for asthma, and uh, the outcome is the asthma mortality, fortunately uh, very rare, but it happens. And then uh, the covariate that we stratified on would be asthma severity. Okay, so these are the people with more severe asthma. You see that there are fewer of those. And here are the people with more severe asthma, less severe asthma, there are more of these. And you see that the inhalers prevent asthma mortality in this completely made up numbers uh, by 50%. So the relative risk is 0.5 in both those with uh, moderate asthma and those with severe asthma. Okay, are you with me so far? Okay, I see some uh, nodding. Um, so the question now is, are these tables collapsible, i.e. can I put these table into a single table, i.e. without stratifying on X, the asthma severity, and still get the same result? So that's the question. What are the rules for me being able to collapse this table into a crude table and still get the same relative risk? Now, I realize that this is a strange way to think about this because we usually go the other way. We have the crude table, and then we stratify, and then we see whether the relative risk is different or not. But uh, let's try to think about this uh, the other way around. So uh, this is your, your, your interactive part here. Anyone, <laughs> any idea? what we could look at, what would make this table collapsible. And if you don't think about it in this way, what would introduce confounding? Because that's what we're talking about when we have a difference between the crude and the stratified, that is usually a definition of confounding, one, one way to define confounding. Okay, so you're not epi PhD students, so I don't let you struggle with this. <laughs> and I'll tell you right away. So this is the only notation that will be in this talk, so relax. 
And so this one here stands for independent of, and this is conditional of. And these tables are collapsible for the relative risk or the risk difference if either X is independent of E. So the covariate is independent of exposure, or if you can turn this around, the logical expression, the exposed and the unexposed are exchangeable. Okay? So they have the same distribution of asthma severity. Okay. Or that the covariate X is independent of Y conditional on the exposure. So we usually say that the covariate is not a risk factor for the outcome in the unexposed. So these are the mathematical conditions for us to be able to collapse these tables. And the important part is here, this word here. So you can, if either of these conditions is true, then the crude table will give you the same relative risk as the stratified one. Okay? And you, obviously, if both of these are true, then you have confounding. You need both of these conditions for there to be confounding. Okay? So when we look at the table now, we see that the exposed and the unexposed are clearly not exchangeable because if you have more severe asthma, you're way more likely to get an asthma inhaler than if you have less severe asthma. And then obviously the asthma severity is also a risk factor for the outcome here. I put in a relative risk of 20 because if you have moderate asthma, your mortality is risk is very low if you have severe asthma. This is actually something that uh, unfortunately happens from time to time. Okay, so um, this is what we call a, a DAG in epidemiology, a directed basic graph. So we have here the covariate that affects the exposure or treatment and independently of the exposure, it affects the outcome of, of interest. And now the collapsibility rules tell us that there are two ways to control for confounding, okay? So we either remove this arrow here or we remove this arrow here, okay? To get rid of confounding. And this is what we do here on the right side with our conventional or traditional outcome modeling. Okay, so we model the outcome as a function of the exposure plus all the other covariates. So if you condition away this arrow here. And now this arrow here, there are several ways to get rid of it. The one that everyone knows about is randomization. Okay, so it makes the exposed and unexposed exchangeable with respect to everything because nothing affects whether you receive treatment or not. None of your characteristics makes you more likely to receive treatment or not. So there is no error here from here to there. Now, when you go back into the epi literature, matching is another way to do this. Uh, so if for every uh, um, 50 year old um, smoker, uh, who is exposed to something, you find a 50-year-old smoker who is unexposed, then you also remove this error, at least for smoking an age. Okay. And uh, if you go further back in the literature into uh, the, the arguments Fisher made for randomization, you'll find very interesting arguments going back and forth whether randomization is better than matching to uh, deal with confounding. And also obviously now uh, this can be done with reweighting populations. So if you reweigh either the exposed or the unexposed or both of them, um, then we can remove this arrow or by restriction. If we restrict our uh, uh, cohort to those with less severe asthma, I also remove this error. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Um, by the way, this only works for the relative risk and the risk difference. 
and that's something that's ignored very often by trialists. Uh, the odds ratio is not collapsible. So if you have a randomized trial and you use the odds ratio, that's still confounded, at least if it's not a null result. So it only works for the relative risk and the risk. Rate. So this is the first piece we need for propensity scores. The second piece is the need for summary scores. And that comes back to the matching part. Matching leads to exchangeability, but as soon as you start to match on more than two or three factors, you run into the problem that you get these cells where there's no one in there. So if you think about age, smoking, body mass index, you're, it's very easy to see that you're very quickly in a situation where it becomes very difficult. And these are only three factors. Now think about six factors. So people very early on thought about combining multiple covariates into a single summary score that they then could use for, for matching. And this literature also dates back uh, uh, quite a bit. So that's uh, 70 years by now. Uh, Miettinen uh, has published on everything that you ever need to know about epidemiology. And so obviously he's in the uh, lineup here too. And then finally Rosenbaum and Rubin in 83, they essentially termed, found, uh, coined the term propensity scores and developed all the math behind it using counterfactual outcomes. So kudos to them because they really made the propensity score something special out of the prior literature on summary scores. They talked about the balancing properties, the causal implications, the estimation and the implementation in their landmark paper um, published in 93. So what is the propensity score? Well, the propensity score quantifies the probability that a person is exposed given his or her covariance. So it's essentially the predicted probability that you're exposed given your covariance x. And you have to, uh, it's hardly visible, that's a bolded x. So that just doesn't just mean age. That's your entire covariate vector here. And it's easy to estimate from the data because we know this is just a prediction model. So you predict the exposure as a function of your covariates. And you get a predicted value out of that model. It's usually done with logistic regression, but more and more people obviously move into more sophisticated prediction modeling. Um, uh, in, 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 in many settings that I'm working in, it has been shown that it's not superior, the machine learning ones. But there might very well be settings where the machine can do a better job in predicting exposure than in the settings that I'm working in. And now, this is the leap of faith that you have to do here. So given the same propensity score, it's not 0.5 for everyone. It could be 0.9, it could be 0.2, it could be 0.1, depending on your age, sex, BMI, and so on. If you have an exposed person, and an unexposed person, they will tend to have the same distribution of covariates. Okay? So that's a large sample assumption. It's not guaranteed as in matching. If you find a 50 year old smoker, an unexposed, you match to the exposed, that's guaranteed. They have the same distribution. Here, it's an expectation. And the gain we get. By making this expectation assumption is that we can use multiple covariates and combine them into a single score. Okay, and so if they are exchangeable at every level of the propensity score, the estimated propensity for being exposed or treated, then we, you can get unconfounded relative risk and risk difference. Okay. So that's all the theory behind it. Okay, so why do we bother? Uh, this is a paper I published when I started working on propensity scores. Um, and we looked through the literature until 2003 here. And you see that uh, we've got a 71 publications mentioning propensity score um, uh, somewhere. 
and you see where we are now. So we have more than 3,500 publications uh, that we pull out of PubMed, an easy search for propensity score. So uh, it's not very sophisticated, but uh, you see that it's still increasing. Uh, so the question is, why is that the case? I mean, obviously it's good for me because I get my grant refunded, but, uh, but <laughs> there should be other reasons uh, for this. Um, so this is just going back to our purely made up example here. So we have only two covariate patterns. You either have, uh, sorry, severe asthma is on this side or less severe asthma. And so what is the propensity? We only have two propensities in, in this setting. So what is the propensity here in those with severe asthma? Well, it's just the probability of treatment, which is 1,000 over 2,000, so that's 0.5. And here it's 800 out of 8,000, so that's 0.1. So we only have two propensities, but if we match exposed and unexposed within the propensity, we achieve the same thing as stratifying on this dichotomous covariate, and obviously that controls for confound by that covariate. And you just need to think about this now, and not just one dichotomous covariate, but 70, 100, 200 covariates that you combine into this single score. Now, once you have estimated this score, you just add it as an, an additional covariate to your data set. So every person, whether exposed or unexposed, they now have a propensity for treatment that's based on their covariate pattern and the probability of treatment in that covariate pattern. And so you can essentially use it as any other covariate in the data set. But you have reduced the dimensionality of all covariates into a single covariate. So essentially you could share a data set that has just exposed yes, no, outcome yes, no, and their propensity propensity scores. So that's, that's all you need to analyze the data. And so many people do use subclassification. You just stratify the propensity score into quintiles, deciles, depending on how many people you have and how many outcomes. You can do the individual matching, and that's the most used method currently, and it seems to be increasingly used. Uh, so for every exposed person, you just look at their propensity score, and you find the nearest neighbor in the unexposed that has the nearest propensity score, and you set them aside, and then you go to the next person. Um, there are more sophisticated methods, but if you have large data sets, that's essentially how it works. You pick an exposed at random, you take their propensity score, you pick the closest unexposed, usually within the caliper, you don't want to be too wide, too far away from this propensity score, and then you go to the next person. There are lots of decisions that you have to make about matching. Do you match with or without replacement? What's the caliper width? And there's a lot of literature out there. And so if you do matching, uh, you need to think about uh, these, these things. Weighting is another uh, approach. Uh, again, you can just this is, comes from sampling uh, theory. So you, if you reweigh uh, your exposed or your unexposed to a standard population, uh, then uh, these two uh, uh, will be exchangeable. They will have the same distribution of covariates and you can just analyze them. The most uh, used one is probably inverse probability of treatment weighting, IPDW, and some people who use IPDW don't call it a propensity score analysis because it uses the propensity in the treated, one over the propensity score, and one, one over one minus the propensity in the untreated. But essentially, it's still based on the same estimated probability of treatment. There are others you could use SMR weighting, and I'll come back to that. Uh, or um, there are newer weights, matching weights, and overlap weights that have been proposed. This one here, just throw the propensity score in your outcome model, is the least appealing of them, because now you have to get two models correctly mm -hmm. specified. Uh, so the propensity score <coughs> model and the outcome model, and so that's kind of doubly unrobust, and why would you ever do that? So 
So I, I don't think uh, we, we should be using that. So I'm going to list six potential advantages of using propensity scores, and then I'll take two more, more issues uh, out of, uh, to, to, to go into in a little bit more detail. So the first advantage of propensity scores is for a very specific setting where you have many exposed or unexposed, whichever is a smaller crew, and few outcomes. Because in a setting where you have few outcomes, you will only be able to control for a very small number of covariates. Remember, if you overfit your model, it's not only bad for prediction, but it also biases your estimate. It's called small sample bias. And if ever you ran into this, it scares you shitless. Because what happens is for each and every covariate that you put in the model, your estimate for the exposure effect moves away from the null. And we have all learned that if the exposure effect estimate moves when you add a covariate, that this is a confounding. Okay. So you think you have to control for that covariate and the next one and the next one. And what happens with each covariate that you put in the model, the estimate will move further away from the null. And as an easy test you can do, it just add a random variable. And if the estimate moves away from the null, you know that you're in, 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 a, in a problematic situation. Okay, so if you have rare outcomes, lots of exposed or unexposed, you can fit a rich propensity score model without that problem of overfitting the outcome model. So that's a setting that often happens actually in epidemiology. Uh, this is another one, I'm clicking through this rather quickly, it's about positivity. So if the covariate distribution of your exposed and unexposed is not overlapping, then you cannot estimate an exposure effect in the people who have non-overlapping covariate patterns. Okay, so if all your exposed are over age 70 and all your unexposed are under age 70, there is no way you can estimate a treatment effect without strong extrapolation. Now, be, be aware that you could still fit an outcome model in that setting. It wouldn't tell you specifically that you, something is happening. Whereas with the propensity score, you can look at the distribution of propensity scores in exposed and unexposed, and you get an overall measure of non-overlap. So if your highest propensity in the treated is 0.95 and your highest propensity score in the untreated is 0.75, you know that you have an overlap problem. You still don't know which covariate causes this, but you can go back to the covariates and figure that out. But you have an easy overall test to see whether you have overlap or not, okay? Treatment barriers. We never focused on who gets exposed or who gets treated when you think about the outcome model. But when you think about the exposure model, that's the obvious something that you will look at, okay? So here is an example from the Medicare population. These are just uh, uh, statin initiators. And here is the probability of statin initiation uh, based on the, uh, lots of covariates, I uh, don't recall how many there were, like 50 or 70. And you see that a lot of things make you less likely to initiate statins for being, example, being in a nursing home, having cardiac arrhythmias, congestive heart failure, dementia, and COPD. And a lot of these make a lot of sense and it's not implying that they should be treated with statins, but this is some, some information that might be important for you to think about, okay? Again, it doesn't imply that everyone should be treated with statins, but it gives you information that previously uh, you might have overlooked. Report covariate balance. I think this is one thing that is a clear advantage of the propensity score. 
So you can actually provide in your paper proof of that the model worked. And you can do this in this table one, and I'm a pharmacoepidemiologist, so these are two anti-diabetic treatments, PPP4 and TZD. And we weight the TZD population to the DPP4 population. You see here, for example, there is a slight difference in age, but after weighting, they have the same age. And you can show this. You put this into your paper. And if you all agree that these are the relevant variables that predict the risk for the outcome, and I can show you that I've balanced all of these covariates across the treatments that I'm comparing, then I have a pretty strong argument for there to be no confounding, okay? This obviously only works for measured stuff. So we still need to have an agreement that I've measured everything that is important. It's not a randomization that also deals with the unmeasured stuff. It only deals with the variables that I've measured. But at least I can show that I've balanced these. Whereas in the outcome model, there is none, none of that. I cannot show you how well my model worked. The reader has, or the reviewer has to believe that. Here I can show it. And by the way, if there are remaining imbalances, I can refit my propensity score to go, make them go away. I can fit interaction terms. I can put in nonlinear terms so that I can essentially end up with a balanced population. Timing of covariates and exposures. This is something that I struggled with in the beginning. Now we are talking about a prediction model, but what am I predicting? I cannot really predict prevalent exposures. So what I can predict is a treatment decision, something, a decision has been made, and I can predict that. Because if I predict something that is prevalent, like obesity, I have to acknowledge that some of my predictors could already be affected by what I want to predict. So I'm in this Yogi Berra situation. It's uh, difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. So if, if I predict the present based on variables that could already be affected by the past, then I have a problem. So what this means in PharmacoEpi, that we focus on new users, in whom a treatment decision has been made. So they are not, you're not looking at people who are on statins or are on these anti-diabetic medications, but we are identifying people who initiate these medications, where the prediction model now makes sense because the variables that I use to predict who gets this treatment, they are not affected by the treatment by definition. So here, this propensity score idea and thinking about propensity scores has actually changed study design. And that's essentially coming back to the title and I'll show you hopefully more examples uh, probably to speed up, speed up a little bit. Okay, the last one, and this is important, is defined populations. So, most multivariable models assume uniform treatment effects. So the treatment effect is the same in everyone. No treatment effect heterogeneity. And they are invalid in the presence of treatment effect heterogeneity because you never know about what population are you talking about. So if the treatment effect is different in those with severe asthma than in those with less severe asthma, by combining them, and setting them equal, I'm not estimating the correct treatment effect in anyone. I'm just getting an overall estimate that doesn't apply to anyone in the population. Okay. Now, with uh, standardization methods, including weighting and matching, I can actually estimate an overall treatment effect in the presence of treatment effect heterogeneity. So that's another advantage of propensity scores. So with propensity score matching or SMR weighting, I can estimate what would have happened to those who got the treatment or the exposure 
if they were unexposed. So my target population for estimation is those who got the treatment. That's a defined population. I can describe them and I know that I'm estimating the treatment effect in these. With IPTW, I get what would have happened if everyone was, were treated versus if no one were treated. That's again a defined population, that's everyone. And by the way, this is what I'm getting from a randomized trial. Okay, so why does this matter? This is an empirical example, Tobias's court thesis uh, uh, back in a school in, in the north uh, east. So um, this was a stroke registry and they looked at um, a thrombolytic therapy and this is a table finely stratified by the propensity score. So these are uh, up here are the people most likely to be treated and uh, down here are the people least likely to be treated. And you see that uh, most of the people are untreated. There is a small proportion that get this thrombolytic treatment. And by the way, we know that this slightly increases mortality. It's still preferred in certain patients because it improves functional outcomes. But there is a slight risk of massive, massive lethal bleeding that comes with the treatment. We know that from trials. Okay, so what are the results here? You see in the treated here, the majority of treated here are up there. Um, the empirical odds ratio is somewhere between around one, let's say, uh, jumping around. In the majority of the untreated here, okay, the odds ratio is somewhere between 1 and 25. Okay. So what will happen if I estimate the treatment effect <coughs> in the treated? It will be highly weighted towards these estimates. And if I estimate the treatment effect in the entire population, it will be strongly weighted to these estimates here. So the treatment effect in the treated was 1.2 and the treatment effect in the overall population was 11. So populations clearly matter. I'll come back to this slide. So coming back to our asthma example, let's assume the inhalers don't really do anything in the people who have less severe asthma because their asthma mortality risk is very low and the treatment doesn't really affect them. It's just purely hypothetical. But in those with severe asthma, the treatment actually even works better than the 0.5 that we previously had. So the relative risk is now 0.25. So now you see, it's very obvious that in the entire population, the treatment effect will be more heavily weighted to this group here. Whereas in the treated, because there is more treated here than here, it will be heavily weighted to this estimate here. Does that make sense? Okay. So you can actually download the spreadsheet here that we published uh, several years ago. And you can plug in your numbers. I just plugged in the exact same numbers here. And you see there is confounding. The overall treatment effect is confounded. Uh, if you use the SMR weighting or the matching, you get an 0.28, which is close to 0.25. And if you estimate the treatment effect in the entire population, you get 0.38. It's not the same. I mean, I can make these numbers even more discrepant uh, by playing around with the numbers, uh, but that's what it is. And by the way, Mantle Hensel it assumes uniform effect. It doesn't give you the correct treatment effect in any population, okay? It's close here to the SMR weighted or the matching one, but it's not exactly the same. Okay, variable selection. What variable should be in a, included in a propensity score? Now, I told you that the propensity score predicts who gets treatment or exposed. So it's easy to conclude that everything that predicts treatment or exposure should be in the propensity score. Okay? That's a pretty uh, easy argument to make. Um, now, fortunately, 
we, we did this simulation study also a long time ago. It's a very simple simulation setup. This is, this is the exposure dichotomous. This is the dichotomous outcome. And these are three different covariates. X1 is a confounder. It affects exposure and outcome. X2 is a pure risk factor. It doesn't affect exposure. It only affects the outcome. And X3 is a so-called instrument. It only affects exposure, but has no effect on the outcome other than through exposure. So it, it is not a confounder. So we have one confounder and two non-confounders. So if you think about the propensity score as a prediction model, these two guys should be in there because they both predict treatment or exposure. And this one shouldn't. So the reality is, however, I'm skipping through this, that it's uh, actually the other way around. So the confounder obviously needs to be in the propensity score model because otherwise it stays imbalanced and will lead to confounding. But the risk factor should also be in the propensity score model because it, it increases efficiency, it reduces variability of the estimate. And the instrument, the one that only predicts exposure, should not be in the propensity score. <coughs> And the reason for that is because it removes variability in the treatment that we need to estimate the effect of the treatment on the outcome without having any beneficial effect because it's not a confounder. So it, adding it doesn't control for confounding. And now the trick is, and we didn't realize when we wrote the paper, it's not in there, it also leads to bias amplification in the presence of an unmeasured confounder. So if we include an instrument into any condition set, we increase unmeasured confounding. So, and the reason for this is in the DAG language, we condition on the exposure and we create this association between the instrument and the co confounder. And if we cannot condition on this one because it's unmeasured, then we increase the confounding effect of that variable by adding the instrument. Okay. So this is my take home for what should be, what is important about variability in treatments. And I think it's mostly important to realize or to check whether it's related to the risk for the outcome of interest. Okay. So if the variability in treatment is unrelated to the risk for the outcome, uh, that's good, okay? If it is related to the risk of the outcome, that's confounding. Now we have two flavors of this. If it's measured, then we can control for it, but we remove good variability. And if it's unmeasured, then all bets are off. So if you wanna have a menotic for this, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So we need good variability. That's variability in treatments that's caused by factors that are not risk factors for the outcome. If every physician were exactly prescribing treatments based on the risk for the outcome, we couldn't do any epi studies on treatments, okay? The good thing is that there is a lot of craziness out there, <laughs> i.e. unrelated to the risk for the outcome. So this is just an example how we can use instruments, the good variability. If we assume that these are two treatments given for the same indication, in, uh, two anti-diabetics. So this one here was the majority of treatments, like 70% was 30% until September 2010, roughly. And then afterwards, this crossed. And this blue one here became the treatment of choice was 90% and this one went down to 10%. Okay, over a very short period of time, we have this crossing of what is the preferred treatment. And if we assume that this short period of calendar time is unrelated to the risk of an outcome, we can just analyze people treated here versus people treated here as an instrumental variable. Use calendar time as an instrumental variable. 
And uh, that actually worked very well in this setting because it's a very strong instrument. Usually instruments are much weaker. So here it's a very strong instrument. But that's a good variability. You need to make the assumption that it's unrelated to the outcome. The bad is structural confounding. If everything is like lumped together and we cannot separate things, if you have to condition on other things, but there is no variability in exposures left after we condition on that. So that's something that plagues a lot of the research uh, in social epi. Okay. And then finally, the unmeasured confounding. That's obviously the ugly stuff that we're dealing with. And in pharmacoepidemiology here uh, on the left is an example where we could add some uh, information on uh, HbA1c, which is a measure of diabetes severity. And you see that between long-acting insulins, and, and this is another uh, anti-diabetic, uh, these categories are hugely imbalanced. So essentially saying that people with more severe disease are all put on insulin and the less severe diseases is put on this one. And if I don't have good measures of this variable, I probably should forget it. And that was the interpretation that we put in the paper on this comparison. We had other comparisons, but we said, can't really use the insulin comparison because we would assume that there is plenty of unmeasured confounding here. This is a study that's been published quite a while ago looking at the flu vaccine and all-cause mortality, and they found such a strong risk reduction that they thought this was impossible. And then they actually did the smart thing to look at the all-cause mortality reduction prior to the flu season, where the flu vaccine couldn't have an effect, and found that the risk reduction was even stronger. So it's all confounding here, because the flu vaccine cannot have an effect prior to the flu season actually hitting, and we have good data on when the flu starts circulating. Uh, so these are the settings where all bets are off and you probably shouldn't do the study. And this obviously led to the entire literature on intractable confounding, starting with Sackett, that's what I grew up with through med school. If you want to look at medical interventions and it's not randomized, just go to the next paper. That's what this article said. <laughs> I mean, that has been read by many people with whom you are collaborating now in the med school. They grew up with this. Just remember that. Okay. Now, this is the solution we found in the meantime, because this is comparing treated with untreated. This maximizes the potential for unmeasured confounding. Whereas what we do these days, we have an active comparator, new user design. So we essentially compare people who initiate one drug with people who initiate a therapeutic alternative. And in that setting, we don't have the confounding by indication anymore. And just to show you how well this works, this is a paper that I was uh, doing with, with uh, uh, John Buse. Uh, from, from the endocrinology here at, at UNC. This is not randomized. This is just looking using EHR data to compare the BMI and those initiating, initiating insulin collagen versus those initiating another in, insulin, NPH insulin. And you see that BMI doesn't affect which one you're getting. It's the strongest indication for the need for insulin in type 2 diabetics. But once you have conditioned on the indication for insulin, it doesn't affect which one you're getting. So we dramatically removed the potential for unmeasured confounding just by study design. So all the, forget about it, that was then and now we are at least in certain settings. This doesn't always work, obviously, in a much better position. And by the way, if you look these things up and spend a little bit of time searching for the literature, you find that people have thought about these things way before. Um, and, and this is a, a paper from Kramer et al. published in 1987, who essentially highlighted exactly that issue that in pharmacoepidemiology we've been focusing on for since 15 years now, so much later. And I'm pretty sure that other disciplines uh, or uh, areas in epidemiology will follow. 
So you implicitly condition on something by comparing two groups rather than just one group versus nothing. Okay, I don't have time to go through this one here. Uh, so let's go quickly here. Uh, all the same thing. So this is, I think, one of my last slides here, and, and now if you have time for questions, is uh, uh, Rubin, so one of the people on Rosenbaum and Rubin, the propensity score paper, has this paper, the design versus the analysis of, of observational studies, where he highlights that the, the argument that I made also, that the study is that the propensity scores can really help you with designing a study. What is the underlying principle of your study rather than just being seen as an analytic tool? And so, um, by the way, if you read that paper, uh, he wrote this as being a hired gun for the tobacco industry. So you have to abstract from that part. Uh, I think the argument that he makes uh, in the wrong situation is still valid. So you, um, yeah, you have to be a little bit of a methodologist and abstract from the content, just see the math behind, um, unfortunately. So these are my conclusions. There is no theoretical or practical evidence that propensity scores intrinsically better control for confounding than anything else we're doing to control for confounding. So it's not pseudo-randomized. It doesn't give you something between epi and a randomized trial. That's all not true, okay? They are great for rare outcomes and prevalent exposures. They can be estimated and implemented without looking at the outcome data. So that's a bias-reducing measure. You can lock away the outcome data. You can fit all your modeling prior to even looking at the treatment outcome effect. The performance of the propensity score, i.e. the covariate bounds, can be communicated. You can put this in your paper. They help us to think more clearly about study design, and for me, this is the most important point. Hypothetical interventions, timing, populations, causal inference, variability of treatments, bias amplification, not not everything you put into a model is good, and all this applies to outcome models as well. It's not specific to propensity scores, but you think more about it. Treatment barriers, equipoise between treatment, non-overlap positivity, and then finally the active comparative to implicitly condition on the indication or a strong risk factor for the outcome that you would like to get rid of because you haven't have, you don't have a very good measure for it. Okay, so this is all. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions. So one question. Uh, one of the uh, one of the things about propensity score is like a, it's a sophisticated matching process, right? And you are matching, you are finding similar groups on, on the basis of observed characteristics. And as you have presented in here, the problem is this an observed function. So one way that people have gone through about dealing with that is to use the outcome information as baseline. Uh, uh, include that as part of the matching process or the propensity score because that uh, outcome at baseline before treatment contains the signal of the unobservables to the extent that the unobservables persist over time. So what is your reaction to that? You see what I'm saying? So you the, mean the actual outcome of your study? The so outcome of the study but at baseline before the, the people oh, are exposed oh, okay, to okay, the program. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so but uh, Yes, that has been proposed, and, and uh, it, 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 there are some additional assumptions that you need to make. Uh, there, there is this um, oh, prevalence ratio something. Uh, yes, that that you could look at some some things that are related to the risk for the outcome prior to that. So essentially, you can put everything into your propensity score that you think will help you to, uh, to identify the risk for the outcome. And so if someone, if your outcome is heart attack, you might very well be 
putting angina or frequency of this into your propensity. Yes. So I've seen some papers that uh, do the matching, some sort of matching based on observables that are basically in effect or not changing over time and then at the same time do a fixed effect estimation. Is it doing anything to just do the matching by, by some observable characteristic like race or income, not in a long time that is not changing? And then so draw some observ some some observations because they are not matched or they, they can't find any match for us for those observations and then estimate a fixed effect model. I mean Yes, so I think the, I'm not exactly sure what you mean with the fixed effect model, but yes, you can iteratively fit propensity scores and exclude patients. So that's Rubin's argument in this paper about using the propensity score for the design phase. So I give you one example, but we, we, we had a study comparing two anti-diabetics and we found that all the covariates in the crude were pretty well balanced. And then one variable, heart failure, was very imbalanced because it's actually almost a contraindication to one of the treatments. The propensity score will very quickly show you that because you have a strong predictor of one of the two treatments. And then we, we ended up excluding patients with heart failure because we didn't think we wanted to balance something that is a little bit strange if it's contraindication for one of the two treatments. So it was almost a non-positivity issue. So we excluded these patients and then re-estimated the propensity score in the restricted population. And yes, you should be doing this because, uh, again, the propensity score can be used to help you identify the population that you actually want to study things in and then there might be other means to control for confounding within that population. I think both these questions are getting at whether you, know, you have a point in time outcome that only happens once versus outcomes that um, can evolve over time like income or uh, BMI or uh, blood pressure or something like that. So I think these guys are asking about, well, you know, can you combine, fruitfully combine propensity score matching with some kind of longitudinal analysis with a repeated measure? Um, and, or do you just control for that lagged outcome in, in either in the propensity score creation process, you know, the, the creation model of the propensity score or? Yeah, I was thinking of repeated outcomes. Yeah. For me, it's a deformation professionnel. I, I, really have repeated yeah. outcomes. So it's not my forte, but what you achieve with the propensity score at one point in time, and you can obviously do this repeatedly, right. but I'm talking only about one time, you can balance populations on whatever you think you want to balance them. So if you want to balance them on prior income and income in a year is your outcome, then the propensity score can help doing that. Um, if you don't want to balance them, then you shouldn't put it into the, the propensity score. So I think it's important to think about what you want to do at that point in time, whether you want to keep some prior information or whether you want to balance on, on what exactly you want to balance population. So it, 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 it gets, in that sense, it gets you closer to the randomized trial because you might remove something that you wouldn't like to keep. Mm -hmm. So um, it looks like the, a demographer and social scientist has been struggling with the uh, propensity score in the uh, NIH study section, population study, social science study section. Usually the proposal proposing propensity score would be filled. So yeah, okay. and the, the typical the typical comments would be uh, you cannot control uh, for things that you don't you don't observe. So you actually you have that on the first you know on the conclusion. And I'm wondering, I think maybe um, you epidemiologists lot you have lots of very specific study problems. So to investigate, you you can really 
find the confounders, that's missing. But in social science and public study, oftentimes the confounders are very general, like uh, if you show neighborhood, neighborhood effects, people, the, crit the critics say the neighborhood is not really neighborhood effects, some selection going on, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, and so for, for population, you know, for demographers, oftentimes they think a uh, program score is not design improvement. Maybe it's a, it's a you know, it's helped with the interpretation or pr presentation of the results. Not, does not help with the fundamental issues of uh, missing confounders. So I could hear what you think. So. And, and I, I could, couldn't agree more. That's why I said, uh, was very explicit about it doesn't do anything yeah. about the unmeasured confounder. And again, <laughs> If you include instrument, if you condition on instruments, and that has nothing to do with propensity score, that's the same if you condition on instruments in your outcome model, you actually increase the bias from unmeasured confounders. So this bias amplification is a real issue. So this, this happens and it's easy to show mathematically that this, this, this happens. Now, um, this may be, that's why I put it up, at, at, one thing you can actually do is, and I've been doing more and more, is to actually look at the distribution of propensity scores. And when you have overlap, like on the left-hand side, so these two antibiotics, uh, you cannot really differentiate them based on measured covariance. You can make an argument that if nothing what that you measure predicts which antibiotic you're getting, maybe it's less likely that there are strong predictors of the, the treatment choice that are unmeasured. It's not a strong logical argument, but you may be using this. Whereas on the right side, if you can predict which antibiotic they are getting based on the measured covariance already, it's more likely that there is additional stuff that you haven't measured that predicts which treatment you're getting. So maybe just looking at the distribution of covariates in the crude is something that we've never done prior to propensity scores. And if you have largely discrepant covariate distribution between your exposure groups, you may wonder whether you can even do a study because of the risk for unmeasured factors. Does that only work if you have an idea that they sort of randomly assigned on the left? Or could it just be that there's something that's absolutely not measured that is determining which thing. Yeah, it, it could be, yeah. I mean, that's where your uh, substantive knowledge comes in. I think the, the interpretation here was that these antibiotics actually have a very similar indication spectrum. And it's probably the question whether you go to UNC or Duke when you have, then you get one or the other. So I think, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm Charlie calls me a medical epidemiologist. So uh, may maybe decisions in medicine are less complex than in other fields. I'm not denying that. So yes, you still need to think about this. It's not proof of anything. It's not a strong logical argument. One more question? If not, thank you very much.